Hey, everybody. Sorry, that's a little bit loud. Um, hi, I'm Kerry Cranston, president here at the American Writers Museum. I want to thank everybody who is here in the room and thank everybody who is joining us online on Zoom right now. Um, we're excited to have our program tonight, a discussion of the book, The First Amendment Lives On. Um, and we are joined tonight by the author of that book and by John Palfrey. Um, John is the president of John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, one of the nation's largest philanthropies um, with offices in Chicago, New Delhi, and Nigeria. Um, Paul III is a well-respected educator, author, legal scholar, and innovator with expertise in how new media is challenging learning, education, and other institutions. He's the author or co-author of um, several books, including Safe Spaces, Brave Spaces, Diversity, and Free Express Expression in Education. Um, we are very honored to have him here today talking to his good friend, Stuart Brotman, um, the author of The First Amendment Lives On. Stuart is an American government policymaker, tenured university professor, management consultant, lawyer, author, and editorial advisor and nonprofit organization executive. He has served in four presidential administrations on a bipartisan basis and has taught students from 42 countries in six separate disciplines, communications, journalism, business law, international relations, and public policy. In an era when censorship and the discussions of the First Amendment are raging across this country from book bannings to the question about who is in control at Twitter and what does that mean, we are very excited to have a conversation tonight about the First Amendment and what it's doing for us and how it's going to live on. So I'm going to give it over to John and Stuart. Thank you both for being here. Gary, thank you. Well, it is a treat to be with all of you here in person in Chicago, and I understand that we have even more people on the live stream on Zoom. This is one of those silver linings from COVID, I guess, which is that we can have people from all over the world and also be here in person. And in particular, Stuart, thank you for coming to Chicago for this event. It's great to be here, John. It's great to be here with you thank and you. great to be here at the museum. Thank you. Um, and uh, to Carrie, Christopher, the team, Allison, thank you for hosting us here in the museum. It's a beautiful space. And if you have not been recently, they have a fabulous new exhibit uh, that you need to come and see. It's been up since September. Uh, and uh, what a great book that we have to talk about tonight, Stuart. This is, this is so exciting. Um, the story of the book, I think, is particularly interesting. So that's going to be my second question. But my first question is what is your First Amendment story? Your, your bio is, it kind of defies um, uh, getting into a few sentences as, as you heard from Kerry, but, um, but I know one of the things you have asked those with whom you've been in conversation is how they got interested in the First Amendment. I'd be curious how that's so for you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think a lot of the people in the book, in fact, everyone in the book, and certainly myself, and I think you and other people, have what I call a First Amendment journey. And my journey started out as a high school journalist like a lot of kids who were in high school, once upon a time, we actually put together newspapers and we laid uh, type and we did all of the mechanical aspects of putting together a high school paper. But what was critical and still remains critical in high school journalism is what do high school journalists cover? And it turns out that high school journalists being budding journalists want to cover things that are interesting and topical and sometimes very controversial. And often you have administrators and teachers and others who would prefer that those sorts of articles not appear in the high school newspaper. Uh, so I, I was very fortunate to have two wonderful advisors in high school for my high school newspaper who essentially said, we will defend you in terms of what you want to publish. And obviously, I was in high school at a time of enormous social ferment in this country in terms of the anti-war movement, in terms of the feminist movement, a variety of other social aspects. And there were things that would not normally be in high school paper that high school journalists really wanted to cover. So my journey really started in high school and went from there. I went to school at Northwestern as an undergraduate and worked in college radio. And college radio was another very fertile area for figuring out what you wanted to put on the air. And I grew up and worked in college radio at a time when alternative radio was just starting. And so there were controversial lyrics that were on the air 
for the first time and there were call-in shows and people who wanted to talk about things. And so working in college radio as well as in high school journalism, I think were really formative experiences. That's found it fantastic. And it sounds like that same tie to journalism and publishing is in part what got you into this project. And I know we're joined here by Christy Hefner and uh, I know she and her family are essential to the story of putting this amazing book together. So maybe tell the story of the book if you uh, like. Sure, and I, I would say Christy, essential, critical. The book would not be possible without Christy and the Hefner Foundation's cooperation. Uh, basically, I found out through a third party that uh, Hugh Hefner Hef had compiled over the course of his life 3,000 scrapbooks, which began when he was a high school student at Steinmetz High School here in Chicago. I think he was about 16 years old. And he did this for 75 years until shortly uh, before he passed away at the age of 91, five years ago. And every week, he essentially would block out time on Saturdays to scrapbook. Once upon a time, that was a verb. And people would literally collect things in their life. Today, we do that with a hard drive, or we do that online. Uh, but he would clip out different things that interested him and had them compiled in the scrapbook. And ultimately, 3,000 of those scrapbooks were put together over the course of 75 years. And the Guinness World Records says that's the largest collection of an individual that ever has done scrapbooking. Uh, and uh, Christie and the foundation granted me uh, a unique and at that time unprecedented access to be able to review the scrapbooks. And I went to Christie and I said, I'd like to see what's in them because there may be something interesting thematically that I'd like to maybe write about, maybe explore further. And, and lo and behold, uh, what I found there was, uh, was really the, the inner voice and the inner thoughts about the First Amendment that Hef had. Some of them were totally unrelated to his business enterprise, unrelated to Playboy. These were things that started again when he was on his First Amendment journey when he was a 16-year-old at Steinmetz High School. And from that, I realized that there was not just his thoughts, but an entire legacy had been created by Christie, which was the Hugh M. Hefner First Amendment Awards. And these awards were created in 1979, and uh, Christie basically was the person behind this. The idea was to really celebrate and honor people who would now be called Profiles in Courage. Not necessarily famous people, although there are a number of very interesting celebrities and journalists and lawyers who have been honored. But, but the vast majority of the people that have been honored, and it's over 150, are people from all walks of life who essentially have had their own First Amendment journey and in many ways have impacted the journeys of, of a number of other people. Uh, I was at the First Amendment Awards this year, which was at the National Press Club. I, I brought the program here. I met a number of the people who won the awards. One of the people I just wanted to highlight, who was just an extraordinary teenager, an eighth grade student, was Jocelyn Diefenbach. She's at uh, Cutstown High School in Pennsylvania, and she was honored. And let me just read this very quickly. As an avid reader concerned about book banning, Jocelyn asked a local bookseller if she could start a book club where she and other local students could read the books that their schools had blacklisted. Firefly Bookstore quickly agreed, and the Cutstown Teen Ban Book Club was born. And they began to read books like George Orwell's Animal Farm and Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give and All American Boys. So a variety of books which now were banned by the school, but certainly she thought would be important for her peers and others to know about. So that's a, a great example. I could go on and on. We could talk literally all night about these 150 or so people. Uh, all of them have been extraordinary, and all of them have impacted their communities. In some ways, they've impacted our country. Uh, so Tom Devine, for example, is the head of the Government Accountability Project. And Tom 
really was the father or one of the architects uh, behind the uh, Whistleblower Act. And so today we have a whistleblower protection for federal employees. That wasn't the case until 1989. Certainly states still don't have that. But when you think about the importance that whistleblowers blowers have for our democratic process, and also the fact that many of them are muzzled or fear that they're going to be disciplined or fired now that we have a legal mechanism. So there's an example of someone who really made a difference. Frank Wilkinson is another person uh, I've had the pleasure of, of learning about. So Frank led the drive to abolish the House Un-American Activities Committee, which was organized in the 1950s to investigate McCarthyism and remained for many, many, many years until it was abolished. Uh, Elaine Williamson in Loudoun County, Virginia, she led a grassroots campaign that essentially reversed the policy of the public library to install internet filters. Mm -hmm. So when people went in and went on online, certain types of online content would not be available, would be filtered. And the First Amendment Awards have also honored some great organizations like the American Library Association and the American Civil Liberties Union. But what I found in addition to that was that there was this extraordinary group of people who I call the greatest generation now, of First Amendment scholars and thinkers and advocates who I really wanted to sit down and talk to, to sort of get the arc of their thinking and journey about the First Amendment. Uh, and so I began to travel around the United States. I started here in Chicago at the University of Chicago Law School uh, with Jeff Stone, the former dean and the former provost, and one of the preeminent First Amendment scholars, and then traveled to New York and Los Angeles and a variety of other places, and, and wound up with uh, eight very interesting conversations about the First Amendment. Stuart, that's a wonderful journey, and I think uh, leads in so many different directions we could go. Certainly want to pick up on banning of books and other uh, current topics. I will pause for a moment on philanthropy and, and with Christy here to note how important that I think it is to use philanthropy to highlight heroes like the ones you've uh, you've mentioned some of whom we know well, you know, famous people like Jeff Stone who've done this, you know, for their careers and also eighth graders who we may not have heard of. Um, and I do think that's a fine form of philanthropy uh, to help all of us to think through what the issues are. Um, and it seems like it also led to your choosing these eight individuals and having conversations with them and, and framing the book. Maybe just talk for those who may not have read the entire book yet, just a tiny bit about uh, the structure of the book, how you, um, you started with Jeffrey Stone's frame and, and built from there. But also one of the things that I think is most interesting about it is we get a sense from the book of where the agreement lies, but also the disagreements that are very important. These, these eight people do not think about the First Amendment the same way. And you draw that out, I think, really, really helpfully. They're all incredibly famous, part of your greatest generation of First Amendment thinkers, free speech and free press advocates, and yet they come out in different places on a couple of the key issues. Uh, absolutely. As I always say, there is no First Amendment orthodoxy. We might want to think about the Second Amendment. In the Second Amendment area, I think there is a general orthodoxy about the Second Amendment. First Amendment is quite different. There are people who have uh, genuinely well thought out, well-articulated differences. And I think part of what the, the book illustrates is that, again, there is no one view of the First Amendment in terms of what must be followed. One thing I learned from the scrapbooks and really sort of spent a lot of time thinking about is how to organize these conversations. And I was greatly inspired by Heft's development of something called the Playboy interview, which is something many of you are familiar with which I, I call literary art form because up until then, and really since then, uh, no one has really come up with a way to have these conversations. They're called interviews, but they're much different than a typical journalistic interview. They're really meant to have a person sort of open their head and their heart at the same time. And as I was walking through the museum this evening, uh, I saw that Alex Haley is one of the people honored here. Alex Haley was the first person who conducted a Playboy interview in 1962 with Miles Davis. 
And since 1962, obviously there has been a range of people. Uh, I have a little list here just to illustrate. And in some ways, the Playboy interviews, when you read them as a body of work, they, they really illustrate a marketplace of ideas. These were not people that Hef necessarily agreed with. In some cases, he may have disagreed with them greatly, but the idea of exposing their ideas to the public and to a wide readership. And so William F. Buckley was there and George Wallace, the segregationist uh, governor of Alabama, William Colby, who was the director of the CIA, and uh, Jimmy Hoffa was there, Betty Friedan was there, Jermaine Greer was there, uh, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., Anita Bryant, the anti-gay activist. And of course, Jimmy Carter was probably one of the more memorable Playboy interviews in 1976 when he was a presidential candidate came up with that famous soundbite about having lust in his heart. Uh, so what I needed to do was sort of reverse engineer, how do you do a Playboy interview? And so uh, what I did literally is to go back for each of these individuals that I was going to have a conversation with and, and read everything they had ever written. Amazing. I thought that would be a pretty easy task, but then I began to look oh, wow. at people's resumes. And when you look at someone like Jeff Stone uh, or Nadine Strassen or David Cole, some of the people in the book, they just have enormous resumes. And not just that, but they have very, uh, very deep and complex articles and books that they've written. So I, I spent a lot of time absorbing their thinking in this area and then the notion that when we actually got a chance to talk uh i did not walk in with any notes and we basically did what we're doing tonight we just had a conversation mm -hmm. and i didn't have any particular thing i was trying to get out of them other than to get them to sort of give some exposure to how they think about things and how they feel about them and you get a little recording, I hope. And yes, and 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 and, they, and yes, and 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 they were uh, they were recorded. I mean, one of the things we thought at the beginning was, do we come in with cameras mm -hmm. and do they video? But uh, we decided, just like the Playboy interviews, these were going to be much more intimate conversations. So literally, I went to either someone's house or someone's office, and we sat down and we talked for hours and. Uh, as you will see in the book, these are not uh, these are not scholarly conversations. I, I think they're intelligent conversations, but the, they were not meant to sort of be a lecture in print. I, I'm really jealous of how you did it. Someday I want to do a book like that. It's really cool. Um, Stuart, so spice it up. Tell us what's the biggest disagreement in that book? Who disagrees with whom? What's the what's the topic? Well, well sure, there are, there are a, a number of them. Well, some of you may be familiar with Citizens United, which is a famous uh, Supreme Court case of a few years ago, uh, where essentially we now have unlimited money that could be spent in political campaigns. That was a challenge that went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld this notion of unlimited speech. Uh, the person who argued that case before the Supreme Court was Floyd Abrams. And Floyd Abrams is one of the, the great First Amendment advocates uh, and certainly was associated with the Pentagon Papers case and opened up this whole world of commercial speech to thinking about the First Amendment. Uh, but Floyd thought this was very important for as a case to take. Uh, and yet you have people like Jeff Stone, for example, who feel that this has really corrupted the political process and really has undermined democracy. And I think there are reasonable people, and both of these people are, are highly reasonable, who, who can have uh, well thought out opinions on this, which could be very, very different. So I think this area of money and speech, particularly money and political speech and campaigns, uh, remains a very vibrant and controversial area. And I think Floyd recognizes that I think in the book he mentions that he's lost a number of friends because of it. And uh, that's one area of, of, of disagreement. Uh, I think getting back to this area of campus speech. So uh, Jeff Stone was tasked to oversee a report at the University of Chicago 
which was a successor to a report that had been done by Harry Calvin, who is a eminent scholar that Jeff studied under with at Chicago. And the notion is what principle should universities develop around freedom of speech? And so he came out with what is now called the Chicago principles. And these have been adopted by about 70 or 75 universities, some public, some private, and essentially indicate that the university in order to be a great uh, bastion of, of, of thinking and free thought really needs to be committed to very strong freedom of speech principles. That sounds very good. Uh, then we have Nadine Strassen. So Nadine is the former president of the American Civil Liberties Union, eminent First Amendment scholar. Uh, and N Nadine says in our conversation that she disagrees with that, not the idea that universities should be bastions of academic freedom and freedom of speech, but that universities also should be able to express themselves as universities. They should not be neutral. And she says universities do this all the time because obviously there are certain principles of being at a university which have uh, un underlying thoughts and comments. And she believes that universities should be speakers as well as vessels for academic thought. So that's a, another area. A uh, third area obviously is social media, which continues to evolve and be very controversial. Uh, and so there we have someone like Bert Newborn. Bert is the founder of the Brennan Center at the NYU Law School and was the former legal director for the ACLU. So uh, Bert believes that some of the problems of free speech on social media are related to the concentration of power in social media. And obviously, we are living through that as we speak today with the acquisition of Twitter by Elon Musk. And so Bert believes there should be some greater attention to essentially breaking up some of these en entities or perhaps applying more stringent antitrust law mm -hmm. or thinking about competition in terms of how, how that's organized. Uh, Jeff Stone believes that it might be good to have something like what used to be in broadcasting called the Fairness Doctrine, which was in existence for many years that essentially said that when there was a controversial issue of public importance that aired on a radio and television station, that essentially the licensee, the radio or television station, had an obligation to air contrasting viewpoints. And you might imagine that might be difficult to do in a social media environment. Uh, Jeff said, well, what if you have a, a pop-up when you see something online? Maybe a little pop-up says, there might be a little different viewpoint, and then you could click on it if you wanted to, but you wouldn't be required to do so. Uh, and then we have Bob Corn Revere is also in the book, who's an eminent litigator in this area. Uh, and Bob, I think, would characterize himself fairly uh, as a libertarian in this area in that he does not believe that any electronic medium, including the internet, should be regulated by the government. And clearly, we have a famous case that came out in the early 1980s, which you know very well, which is the ACLU versus Reno case. But the Supreme Court has actually spoken on the power and the uniqueness of the internet as a medium. And I think Bob would advocate, and I would probably agree with him as well, that there should not be any greater restrictions on the internet. Wow, well, I don't know how much time we have, but I would love to get back to all of those three topics, but I'm not sure we're gonna make it, but let, we'll, we'll try. Um, I do wanna say that in about 15 minutes or so, we'll, we'll open it up for, uh, for questions, so feel free to, to come back to it. But I think if we can get to uh, your campus speech topic, democracy, as well as um, uh, Twitter, we should do it. So uh, for those who are watching this on YouTube later, this is the day before the election in midterms here in November of 2022, so democracy is on the ballot. You put out book bans. I think on the ballot is also the ability to teach what people want to teach. So the, the CRT debate across the country, there are many debates, I think, that are kind of free speech debates a little bit behind the, um, behind the scene. Of course, the Supreme Court will be taking up a few specific speech cases. They're going to take up the affirmative, or are taking up the affirmative action cases, all which speak on it. What's on the ballot tomorrow or this, this year, Stuart, and, and how does this connect to the bigger questions of democracy? 
Well, I think if we go back to Jeff Stone, Je Jeff really believes, and again, I may agree with him, that uh, democracy is really on the ballot. And to the extent that we have a First Amendment, it's so intricately related to having a democratic process and a democratic system. And unless and until we have the sort of robust First Amendment protection, we're probably not going to have the democracy that, that we want. And so it's, it's very important. There is so much happening, not just at the national level, but at the state and local level now, because clearly schools are controlled locally, by and large, not nationally. And so we have school boards, we have library boards, and we have a number of underlying government organizations, and some are elected, some are appointed, that are now involved in this whole area. I think the last time I looked, there are about 140 bills right now throughout the United States that essentially are controlling specific aspects of what could be taught from K through 12. And so it's not just little kids, it's really the entire primary and secondary education system. And so, so all of these things are to some extent on the ballot, even though many people are not aware how intricate and how complex the relationship is between banning books or restricting content and going to the ballot box itself. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's such a such a crucial moment on all these fronts. And if there were another another whole podcast and discussion, I'd love to get into your thoughts on whether these 140 plus bills will be able to stand. It seems to me so many of them are so content specific and at least procedurally, you'd think there might be some concerns. But in any event, um, you mentioned local. I did want to ground us here in the great city of Chicago. One of the really exciting things that's going on, and Christy and others have been involved in this, is I think a, a real renaissance in the news space that um, particularly as there have been many changes in the business model uh, on the for-profit side, there are both for-profit and lots of nonprofit organizations in lots of communities, very diverse around the city that are popping up and, and growing really effectively um, as, a, as a, a way of covering the city and in, in a way I think that's honestly more genuine and more, more effective than the past. And I wonder if you could tie in some of these kind of local press issues to, to this book, which of course um, does touch uh, on, on some of that as well. Sure. Well, one of the people I had a wonderful conversation with was Lucy Dalglish. And Lucy currently is the Dean of the Barrow College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, but spent many years at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, where she was the executive director. Uh, and so we really talked about the future of journalism, and in particular because she's responsible for training future journalists right now. Uh, I, I'd say the good news is we are, to some extent, in a early renaissance of journalism. I think there is great interest now, particularly in people studying journalism. As you say, there is now almost an organic process of local media and certainly philanthropy supporting it, the MacArthur Foundation and others uh, who are doing it. So I, uh, I'm reasonably optimistic in terms of that. I'd say if there was going to be a pretty encouraging theme here. It might be in the free press area. Uh, so I think last week or we, the week before, uh, the Attorney General Merrick Garland actually issued a memorandum which essentially said that the Justice Department from this day forward will not ask for the confidential sources of journalists. And that is a big deal, at least at the federal level. Clearly, we don't have shield laws, which means that this can be done at the state level or the local level. Uh, but to have the Attorney General of the United States now say, we essentially are drawing a red line and no longer will subpoena journalists for their confidential sources and bring them before grand juries. And if they obviously don't testify, we can put them in jail. We had a series of these incidents really in recent history. And so I, I think that's a really encouraging development that's happened in the area. Uh, and also, we've seen recently a, a number of major libel suits mm -hmm. uh, in this area where I think the media has withstood the potential for being undermined by, uh, by our laws of libel and, and defamation. And so I, 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 I'm pretty optimistic in terms of where things are. Obviously, so much of it depends on the business model right. and 
I think that's another conversation for another time, but I think to the extent so far that not-for-profit, I know the Chicago Sun-Times here yep. is an example, and other foundations and uh, other ways of thinking about journalism. And again, going back to the First Amendment journey, there is an enormous amount of good journalism and exciting things that are happening on college campuses with uh, student media. And again, they're not just newspapers anymore. There are uh, college television stations and news broadcasts and podcasts. So we're really in a good space, I think, there. It's so interesting to think about it from the perspective of the right to a free, the free press and, 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 the, and the sort of policy side of that, where there's a decent story. I think on the, as you say, the business model side, it's a much more challenging yes. picture. And when you think about, at least in the United States right now, that there's about a third of Americans in rural areas in particular do not have a daily or a, a, you know, a meaningful kind of local media coverage that they had you know, a generation ago and so forth. So it has gotten much trickier. And I think that ties into those democratic conversations at the same time, so the legal protections seem like they're uh, maybe more robust. But let's, since you brought us uh, over to the campus. So one of the things that I, I wanted to press you on a little bit, which I think is, uh, is one of the more troubling kind of stories here but behind the scenes, um, I, I've gotten very interested in the data around who supports the First Amendment and, and in what ways. And if you have followed the, the series of studies that the Knight Foundation has funded, um, what's clear is that actually young people do support the First Amendment. Strange that people, the media often say, you know, kids don't believe in It's actually not true. The support for, for free expression, particularly among young people, has actually uh, gone up, not down over time. Um, so there's not, this is not a generation that hates free speech. That's not true. But there are very challenging issues within the data um, in terms of who supports it. So if you're asking a white young person, they're much more likely to support the First Amendment um, and to believe that it protects them than if you ask a young person of color. And so we've got a complicated story. And if you think about who works on First Amendment, my observation is that many of those of us who have devoted ourselves to it are white, that there are actually not that many people of color who've been, been working on the topic and so forth. It is, to my mind, a, a challenging circumstance. I wonder if that came up in your, uh, in your discussion, because of course these are, you know, these are for and should support all of us, but, but that's not really how it's perceived uh, or maybe playing out in, in, in practice. Absolutely, and I, I think the Knight Foundation and then the Freedom Forum, there have been several major organizations which have done tremendous work in terms of being barometers saying, you know, how do people feel about this now? Uh, so it goes both ways. Uh, what we see, as you say, is that uh, generationally, we still have younger people who believe in the First Amendment. We have older people who believe in the First Amendment. What's interesting is it's now breaking down by race, by gender. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of quick statistics here. So um, in terms of men and women, uh, men are more favorable towards greater First Amendment protection than women. At least this is what the data shows. Uh, I, we would not have thought that maybe 10 or 15 years ago, but now we have data that we can deal with. Uh, I just spoke a little bit about uh, how encouraged I am or reasonably encouraged I am about journalism, but the data is not as encouraging. So for example, in the latest survey of the Freedom Forum, uh, on the First Amendment, they found that the majority of Americans, again, in the survey, want journalists to be licensed. And that obviously is, is antithetical to everything we think about in terms of freedom of speech. Uh, a near majority, 46% of the people who were surveyed, uh, want to have content related to sexual expression or sexual identity in books restricted. Again, antithetical to the First Amendment. So I, I think the, the data, when you look at it, can be quite troubling. And I think it's also a way for us to begin to think, how do we move that needle in a more positive direction? How do we get some of those views changed? When I was the head of school, and to some extent as a, as a law professor, one thing I observed in the discourse when this topic would come up was that either often, I'm oversimplifying, but this happened too often, either you were for the First Amendment, and often were perceived actually to be on the right in the conversation, or you were for diversity, and you were perceived to be on the left. Do you see that dichotomy? Did this play out? And, and do you see any way of, of resolving that? Because my, my sense is that's not a particularly healthy way to see the topic. It, it isn't. And again, this is uh, well beyond 
what I call the jurisprudence of the First Amendment, cases and precedents and everything else. And we, we need to think a lot harder and deeper and I guess more systematically about how we create a First Amendment culture mm -hmm. in our society. And so the culture, obviously, that would span racial, gender, ethnic uh, divides. And I, I don't think we've really done as good a job as we can in that. And again, I think everyone does have a First Amendment journey, but we need to begin a, a larger national conversation about the First Amendment. I think when the First Amendment awards were organized by Christie in 1979, uh, one of the things that was done was that the Zenger papers, John Peter Zenger was obviously a famous publisher in the pre-revolutionary time, who was prosecuted by the British for libel and was acquitted and became a champion of what we now know as freedom of the press. Uh, but those papers toured around the country and also high school students began to write essays, what the First Amendment means to me. Uh, what, what if we sort of did the same today, but we did it on TikTok? Yeah. What if we had loads of TikTok videos out there with people talking about the First Amendment? Uh, I just want to spend a couple of minutes because I know we've spoken about this and I've written about it. Uh, this notion of maybe before the baseball game or the basketball game or the football game, maybe when we rise to do the Star Spangled Banner, the announcer says, and now let's recite the First Amendment, and then we sing the Star Spangled Banner. And of course, we have jumbotrons, so it's pretty easy to read those 45 words. But imagine if every game we went to had that. And of course, all of these games are televised. And so we, just like we learned the Star Spangled Banner, we would be able to, to do that. The same for movie theaters. Every time we go to a movie theater, when you have the previews and the commercials coming on. And the what, copyright notice. Right? And the copyright yeah, notice, right? Right, don't video. What, what if you had someone in that uh, movie come on and say, this movie is here partially because the government doesn't restrict it. And this again ties back into what I saw in the scrapbooks and, and Hef, but Hef had a particular passion for movies and movie censorship, meaning not having movie censorship. And uh, the other person in the book who is really different than the people we've spoken about uh, is uh, Professor Rick Jewell at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. And Rick is one of the great scholars of film censorship. And many people don't remember or realize that we have a long history in the United States of movie censorship. And it was only until the 1960s that we had uh, censorship boards that looked at movies in cities. The last one was in Dallas. It was abolished in the 1960s. But once upon a time, if you wanted to show a movie here in Chicago or in New York or in Dallas and certainly in Boston, everyone knows banned in Boston, that had to be viewed by a, a government board which essentially said, we will decide whether or not people should be able to see that. So we, we've come a, a long way, which I, I think is good. But what's interesting in the conversation with Rick is to retell and relearn the history of movie censorship, which is very important. And the other really interesting aspect of the book with Rick uh, was that uh, Hef taught with Rick movie censorship at USC for 20 years. And I don't think anyone knew this. Mm -hmm. And it was certainly not part of his public persona, uh, but it was something that he really loved and was really dear to him. And he showed up every year and uh, basically ended each of the semester's classes on movie censorship with a completely open discussion about movie censorship, about obviously some of the issues he was dealing with in the First Amendment. And he ultimately was called the third professor because his two colleagues there obviously were teaching the course, but without having him sort of bounce those ideas, the course would not have had that texture. So Stuart, last question for me, then we'll open it up, which is to bring it home with Elon Musk, Twitter, 
one of the things that's happened since he took over in the last few days that I've heard reported, and I have not verified this myself, although I've been on the platform, is a huge rise in hate speech. Very, very quickly increased use of the N-word, for instance, in the, in the last um, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, what's your reaction to this, this big change in our social media world? Well, it's a, it's a mixed reaction. I mean, one thing I always do is I go back to the data and although Twitter is an important part of our cultural conversation today, it's not as important as we think it is. Mm -hmm. And so uh, only about 15 million people in the United States are really active Twitter users. How many Twitter users here by hand? Twitters? Okay. And, uh, about a third, maybe. Yeah. So out of a population of 330 million people, 15 million people essentially are intensely involved with Twitter. So the, the the question is, how much should we worry about those 15 million? Are they essentially the people who will wind up influencing those other people? So and Twitter is not even the most popular social media outlet. So today we have TikTok, for example, which is a much larger outlet, and YouTube. And so one of the questions also is, what what do we do not just about text-based messages, but we're talking about the world of video messages. And ultimately, we're going to be in the world of the metaverse, where we're going to have three-dimensional experiences. So we, we are literally just at the beginning of this journey that we're all taking collectively with respect to the First Amendment. And I think that's part of why I call this the First Amendment lives on, because it's it's organic. We're, we're living it. We are, uh, in some cases, we're not quite sure what's going to happen. And, and I think that's part of the experience, but we also have the ability to shape it and certainly to look back and rely on some of these tremendous thinkers and advocates in this area. And I'm, I'm glad I was able to capture them. I'm glad you were too. It's a fabulous book. I hope everybody will read it. I will note that that was an artful dodge and you did not answer the question, but I said it was my last question. So uh, over to the audience and Carrie, I think has a mic and would like for people to speak into the mic, right? To yeah, so um, just so the people online can hear your questions. Um, we have about 40 people online who may have some questions of their own. So I'm encouraging them right now to type their questions into the Q&A function on Zoom, and we would love to hear from you. And I'm going to ask if there's anybody here in the room that would like to ask a question of our panel. Thank you. That was terrific. I'm going to go out and buy the book and great moderating. The question I have, and you touched upon a little bit with respect to the TikTok examples and, the, and before the games, which I don't know how realistic that is, but really how we build in to education at levels, a curriculum, because it's such a misunderstood amendment at this point. If you are on Twitter and you follow the various claims about what role private companies have or public companies, so you really have a situation in which people think they understand about the First Amendment and how it's been used and who's had the voice. This is a, a, a theme that Marianne Franks in The Cult of the Constitution touches upon in terms of who really had voice throughout this history. So how, how do you think about a curriculum-based approach so that kids and you talked about it from your your journey but how you spread that word in a way that kids coming out of high school actually have a basic understanding of what the first amendment means thank you uh, thank you the excellent question we talked about this in a number of conversations in the book and i think there was almost a unanimous opinion that we really need to be doing a lot more in this area uh, some of it unfortunately is that we don't have civics education anymore and realistically it's unlikely we are going to come back and have that sort of civics education but there is some good news in the area so for example the national constitution center which is a nonpartisan resource and khan academy which does enormously rich uh, online programming they have just announced a new initiative which is really going to focus on the First Amendment. So we're going to have really an entirely new set of curricula online that are gonna be available. They could be used by teachers. They could be used directly by students. So having resources like that, I think are very important. Uh, I think secondly, getting back to this area of culture, 
Kids learn today by culture. They learn by music and movies and TikTok. And the more that we have other ways to reach them as opposed to just in the classroom. So there was a whole generation, which is not our generation, but probably uh, a couple of steps behind us, uh, that used to watch a series called Schoolhouse Rock. And Schoolhouse Rock was a series that apparently influenced a whole generation of kids because they put together these animations and these really catchy songs, one of which is I'm Just a Bill, which teaches students about how legislation gets done. And I talk to people who are now in their 40s or maybe early 50s who literally grew up with that type of program. And so again, uh, formal education should be part of the process, online education, but also something that resonates within the culture as well. Let's just add two little bits and then we'll give it to Christy, but, um, sorry. No, I, I have also a oh, oh, why don't you go for it? Yeah, absolutely. Another uh, initiative that's been going on uh, for, I think about eight years now, six years, is called um, the News Literacy Project. And uh, it was started by a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, former journalist who spent most of his career at the LA Times, Alan Miller. And it was dedicated to exactly this problem, which is we need to teach news literacy, which in part has to rest on an understanding of and support for the First Amendment, but go beyond that. And they developed a lot of curriculum, ones called Checkology, and they've been extremely successful. Chicago was a real epicenter of launching it. Um, the McCormick Foundation has been a terrific supporter, but they're in a lot of school districts. And then a few years ago, they recognized that it wasn't just students that needed these skills and this perspective and so they've started to launch more products that are just out there and available but that's another for anybody who's interested in the topic which hopefully everybody is um, news literacy projects another one to look at it's, yeah it's a great resource would second that and in addition to mccormick foundation macarthur hey, foundation McCormick. in fact has supported as well um, which i verified on my phone just to be totally sure um, <laughs> but in fact we did um, but i did want to i did want to just um, Maybe it's an ad as opposed to a correction on the civics front, which is, and stand up a little bit for Illinois, mm -hmm. which is to say, in fact, and be, it is both the McCormick and MacArthur Foundations that invest in this, there is a civics requirement in the state of Illinois. Yeah, both, amen. Amen. Both, amen. by the way, yeah, mm -hmm. both, uh, by the way, in the middle school and the, and the high school. And I have a child who's in the public schools here in Chicago, and she took a course this past year in her public high school. And I will say that what she learned in that civics course, which was, um, it happened to be an AP government and politics class, it was amazing. And by the end, she knew more about the amendments than I did, for sure. And we studied them together. I was a law professor, all the rest. I promise you, actually, that this particular requirement required to graduate from uh, school, public school and high school in, in uh, Illinois is really meaningful. Um, and I think I may have it wrong, but it's a little over a dozen states in the country. So it is not the case that it is not required in the United States. It is required in too few places, and yes. it's not taught as well as it could be, et cetera, et cetera. But the things that are happening actually are kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I would agree, and you made my day just mentioning that. Uh, I think also just in terms of financial support, going back to high school journalism and uh, speech and debate, uh, a lot of those programs are being cut or are not being nurtured. And so we have a lot of private philanthropies now locally coming in and saying, we'll, we'll pay for a debate team. We will help support a local high school newspaper. I think, again, that helps to mm -hmm. nurture a, a value behind the First Amendment of free speech and free press. But I'm, I'm really happy to hear about the civics requirement. And as you say, 12 is at least a starting point. Let's work from there. Might be 13, not sure. I wonder if you could address uh, the First Amendment being constrained as, as applying to the government controlling speech. And in a sense, technology has hurtled past it. Back when the US mails was the central distribution hub, then if they said the Tropic of Cancer couldn't go through it, they, you know, the, the courts could, could loosen that up. Now that Elon Musk owns Twitter, you know, the, while the image of the government keeping him from somehow corrupting such an important, and I think it is important, a vehicle for speech, that would be almost the same uh, 
uh, I write for the Sun Times, you wouldn't want the government to come in and start to dictate to us how to run the paper. So is, is there not sort of a dilemma where you know, private individuals are encouraged to have free speech, but that speech uh, sometimes can be corrosive and the government's powerless to affect it? Absolutely. This is one of the tensions that I think are in the book in terms of the various people. As I said, people like Bert Newborn or Jeff Stone really would subscribe to this notion that even though these are not government entities, these are private entities, they are acting in a government-like fashion, and there should be some restrictions in the way that we have restrictions under the First Amendment. Uh, but there are other people, as they say, like Bob Cord Revere, uh, who's also an eminent thinker and advocate in this area, who says, no, we shouldn't do this. And what Bob has in the book, which I think is quite powerful, is an illustration of what he calls the five screen problem, which is if you had five different screens, one was hooked, hooked up to a broadcast station, one was hooked up to a cable television system, one was hooked up to a video game player, uh, one was hooked up to the internet, and when I always forget what the fifth one is, Christy, but essentially there are five different screens. And right now in this country, we don't have any uniform way of thinking about that. So if something is on a broadcast television station, it might be restricted in the way that it would not be if it was on cable or if it was in a video game or if it was on a DVR, which would be the other one. So. Uh, to some extent, these conflicts or these tensions are ones that the judges really have to think about and think very hardly, uh, very uh, difficult with great difficulty. Uh, so the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg essentially was a great advocate. She never saw this during her lifetime. I'm not sure it's going to happen during our lifetime, but she really said we need to reconcile all of these technologies so there's a, a uniform way to protect them and right now we have various protections depending on what your screen is hooked up to which seems pretty crazy i was really surprised by one of the statistics you mentioned which was the gender disparity in the belief of uh, free speech um, i wonder if you could dig into that a little bit more how wide the disparity is and if you have any underlying understanding of what's driving that disparity? Well, the numbers I have here, and this is from the Freedom Forum 2022 First Amendment survey, is that 72% uh, of men uh, believe that there should not be any restrictions of offensive speech on college campuses. But 57% of women would come out the, on, on the opposite side. So in terms of, of a gap, we see a 15 percentage point gap, which seems to be you know, quite wide. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, at least the survey doesn't really dig deep beneath that, but I think these are important questions to ask, which is not just what is the data, but what is causing that data. And certainly from a trend standpoint, is that going to increase or decrease over time? But I think ultimately our goal should be to try to diminish the gap between different genders, different races, different ethnicities. And again, that gets back into education and culture. Mr. Stewart, I'd add two I things. think it relates, John, to a question that you asked or a point you made about the racial gap, yes, yeah. that it, it's really important to elevate voices like Martin Luther King's or like Nadine's, who are representative of the communities who have been more marginalized and therefore may be inclined to favor more censorship as a way of protecting against harm without understanding that actually censorship inevitably works against the most marginalized. Same in the trans community or the gay community. So I think part of the, the I, I understand where it comes from, and I think the answer to that is to elevate voices from those communities to make it clear that it's not a trade-off. In fact, the First Amendment free speech protections, as, as King argued so powerfully, were precisely what allowed them to have the civil rights right. marches in the South. 
So the, you know, the, the history of it is so interesting. And there's, again, this is a whole other uh, discussion. But if you think about the, I think the best 19th century speech about free speech is Frederick Douglass, a plea for free speech in Boston, right? And you talk about King and the suffragettes, suffragettes for sure. And I was going to say the, you know, the um, free speech movement at Berkeley, like, I don't think that was the right, you know, ultimately. So it, it's an interesting question. It's, you know, who, who feels that they need this set of protections to say whatever's unpopular at different points. Um, and I think there has been a, a sort of a flipping of these politics. The race piece, though, and, and I have dug in some on this in speaking with, uh, in the context of, of trying to understand and, and study this topic on campuses some, um, you uh, uh, mentioned that this is about the First Amendment, not just about free speech. And of course, the First Amendment, we, it's almost like we should do, Congress should make no law and actually re recite it so we actually know what's in it um, ourselves. But, but the right peaceably to assemble is actually part of what undermines the rest of the First Amendment for young kids of color right now. And, and this is because of, I think, since Ferguson and some of the other uh, um, moments of taking to the streets, a sense that you do not have the same right to protest if you are a young kid of color. That bleeds over into a sense about free speech not being for that young person. So the right peaceably to assemble being clustered in with these other rights in the First Amendment actually has an undercutting effect on free speech and free press for this complicated reason. So there's much more research to be done to understand it, but it is really thinking about what, what would it look like to have a truly inclusive First Amendment from the perspective of all Americans? That's not something we have right now. This is a quick question from Jackie, who's watching via Zoom. What are your thoughts about the growing problem of deep fakes, the ability to create the illusion that a news source is bona fide and not fake? Well, I'm not sure it's a First Amendment issue. I, I think uh, you know there may be issues in terms of deception. Obviously, when we talk about voting, you can have political candidates who have deep fakes who essentially are saying things which are not what they are uh, behind or, or about. So, so I think we may have to have a series of other laws or regulations that deal with the deception part. And certainly we have that in the First Amendment area quite broadly. I mean, you, we have the Federal Trade Commission, for example, which prohibits deceptive advertising. That doesn't violate the First Amendment. So I think we, again, are at this beginning of our collective First Amendment journey to, to think about how we want to regulate deep fakes. And so far, the, the technology is not at the level of pervasiveness or even uh, it hasn't been perfected at the level where we can worry about it. There are examples of it, clearly. But in terms of being a widespread medium, this would be a good opportunity for us to begin to think about what are the implications of that five or 10 years from now. I would situate it in the context of mis and disinformation more broadly and misinformation being just information that's wrong disinformation being information that's wrong purposely right trying to trying to mislead someone and and deep fakes would plainly be in that second category and this I would bring it back to the, the Twitter example, I, you know, I think that those companies that are seeking to use their technology and their powers, despite not being regulated in the same way by uh, by the government, um, to to cut cut down on this are doing the right thing. And I think those that are backing off of that too far, which I believe is happening quickly on Twitter, I think is going to lead to more of this in, in, in a way that's uh, that I think is actually pernicious. But again, we're close to time and that would be a whole other session. What about, say, the business community? Because large publishers or internet platforms, whenever uh, there's something controversial, they have a tendency to back down rather than stand up for free expression. Like, for example, uh, I read about Facebook, about giving to the police uh, someone that had some kind of abortion or, uh, or, or, or some of these platforms, uh, they, they, they have a tendency to cave into pressure. Well, we've seen some of that, but we've also seen the other side of it, which is I think the corporate community has been quite vibrant in a number of areas which typically businesses would say, we don't want to touch this because it's too controversial. And so certainly, for example, in the post-George Floyd environment, we've had a number of businesses essentially stand up and, and take positions which would not necessarily be commercial positions they would have taken in the past. And so I think that's all very healthy. We have companies now which 
have found their voice and are beginning to speak, they're not doing this as just blind enemies. Clearly, companies are run by people and people who work there and people who want to be attracted to work at a particular company. And so people now have more voices as employees. We've seen this in a number of contexts where essentially people say, we don't like what the company stands for. We don't like what the company is saying. Therefore, we don't want to work there or we are going to be less inclined to want to work there. So I, I think that's healthy. But getting back to your point, yes, there are a number of companies which essentially are not in that vanguard or essentially don't want to step forward and say anything. And with that, I think we have reached um, an hour and I think uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. And we wanted to thank both of you for being here tonight and talking us through this very deep and important topic. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. <laughs> and to everybody online, thank you for joining us tonight. And just as a point of reference, we have some copies of Stuart's book for sale up at the front. If you do not own one already and want to buy one, you can buy one at the front desk. If we run out because there was a shortage, um, we will take your name and order you a copy. But Stuart can sign um, anyone for anyone who buys a book tonight. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, John. Thank you.